created using Powtoon. Hello everyone, good day. Um, my name is John and today I'll be discussing Renaissance Engineering and as we have watched the video we already know that um, Renaissance Engineering or Engineering on the period of Renaissance or Renaissance as we all know um, covers 14th to 17th century and it you know it began about the late 1300s in the southern parts of Europe you know when they experienced the initial stirrings of a profound movement now known as the Renaissance so this rebirth refers specifically to an artistic and intellectual renewal movement which sought to encapsulate the idea that it, it was time to put aside many of the unenlightened medieval practices and seek a revival of the more uplifting facets of classical cultures of the ancient world, especially that of Greece. Alright, so um, in this part, we will be uh, discussing three reasons that Renaissance was extremely influential in the field of engineering. So uh, the first one is it's because uh, they have the goal of crafting proficiency. So uh, the Renaissance began as a result of the widespread development of accomplished and widespread crafting skills. That's the first one. And the second one is private wealth. So private wealth was accumulated, which provided funds for architecture, economic activities, and cultural patronage. And the third one is interest in novelty. So innovative thinking sparked an increased interest in novelty and a wide range of innovative technologies. All right. So um, right now we all know that you know society uh, became more inquisitive and adventurous, and the ensuing European Industrial Revolution provided considerable opportunity for device development. So this emerging Renaissance engineering era beca became the springboard to an expansive and subsequently modern age. All right, so um, there are things that is interested to know as to how Renaissance became um, evident or became influential even in the current time. So like the beginning of the um, medieval era with, it, with its exceptional Hagia Sophia, um, the beginning Renaissance period also coincided with a rem remarkable building project. So actually in the 1430s, the multi-talented Italian craftsman Filippo Brunelleschi uh, became the principal designer and construction supervisor for a most prestigious project of the time. This is uh, what do we call the dome for the cathedral in Florence, Italy. So but unlike the dome of Hagia Sophia, which was you know, primarily impressive when viewed from its interior, the, the interesting part with the Florence Dome was to be also impressive from afar. So this project succeeded most conspicuous, conspicuously um, for its appealing geometric proportions together with, with its distant visibility generated considerable public pride and approval even today. All right, so we also have here um, movable type printing. So invention and innovation have always been important to the evolution of changing human perspectives and to the development of new institutions. All right, so the idea of block printing was actually first conceived in China about 200 BCE when page-sized stone surfaces were incised with ideographs and then coated with ink for pressing onto paper. So in general, the, these early attempts at block printing were very laborious largely because of the time required for a leaf carving of complex Asian ideographs. Moreover, the images were not particularly clear and prone to fade. In contrast to complex Asian um, writing, the main alphabet of Europe at the time, the Latin alpha alphabet, possessed uh, fewer than 30 essential symbols for vowels and consonants, 10 numerical characters, and several um, grammatical and you know essential symbols. So. With the advancement of metal crafting, the German artist Johannes um, Gutenberg uh, developed a, a means of precision casting the mirror images of alphabet letters 
at the end of punches made of an alloy of tin, uh, lead, and an antimony, then uh, this could then be accurately and adjacently mounted and subsequently reused on transportable and movable printing plates for placement between faces of an adapted wine press. So, okay. So, um, let's move forward. We also have here the, you know, the oceanic explorations. So, the earliest prehistoric form of water transport involved logs and rafts of the Sumerians. So, uh, soon after, Egyptian reed and wooden boats were triangular and square sails plied in Nile. And expanding Mediterranean trade by the Phoenicians led to merchant ships, and then the Persian and Greek naval interests led to multi-tier oared vessels, so most also equipped with sails. And then um, next in this progression came the Viking ships, providing invasion versatility. But towards the end of medieval period, European mariners had adopted the magnetic compass, you know, much as it is presented known as freely rotating balanced magnetized needle with a windrose background in a fully enclosed glass covered wooden box. As we all know, uh, the compass. They had also adopted uh, the sand glass for short time measurements and developed two additional devices to aid in sailing far from coastal visual reference points, coastal maps, and the knotted rope. All right, so. Oceanic exploration by Europeans was initially motivated by a very specific commercial interest prompted by crusading knights and other adventurers who had returned from the Middle East with tantalizing objects such as spices, dyes, silks, and porcelain. So these goods had their origin in Asia and soon become luxury commodities in Europe. So beginning in the early 1400s, Portugal's uh, Prince Henry, also known as Henry the Navigator, promoted a national interest in shipbuilding and navigation. Well then, um, they have soon developed the Portuguese caravel. It's actually the one that we can see here. Um, that's on the left side. It is a highly maneuverable ship designed with triangular sails and manned by a crew of 20 to 25 and you know began island hopping to the Azores and Madeira Islands all the while collecting navigational data to be incorporated on maps and tables so based on this experience the portuguese mariners acquired sufficient skills and confidence to explore the west coast of africa eventually leading to navigate on the southern hemisphere and discover the cape of good hope then um after that the key uh to the portuguese pioneering seafaring accomplishments was evidently their use of the triangular sail on their um, caravels. So derived from Egyptian sources, this sail, it's uh, often called Latin, served exceptionally well for tacking against the wind in a zigzag path, thereby allowing near coast and river estuary explorations. So uh, after that, about 1450, as a result of Portuguese, Spain, and Italian shipbuilding and sailing experience, a sturdy ship design emerged with considerable stowing volume and survival capacity. Then after that, uh, they have um, created or they were able to develop uh, the one that we call the, um, the Karak. So the Karak uh, design could be varied in many details as it turned out made history on numerous occasions. And a significant change to the basic Karak design occurred in the early 1500s. So uh, we can actually see that here on this part. That's uh, what do we call the Karak design. So uh, those are the interesting or those are some of the significant developments during the Renaissance period. And by the way, uh, this is a Karak and uh, this is a Galleon. This is actually Galleon. So, right now, uh, we'll be talking about uh, the emergence of engineering specialties during uh, the Renaissance period. So, we can actually see um, significant development in terms of theories as well as um, in terms of ideas that is definitely helpful even up to this time. So, we have... Uh, seen developments of um, engineering specialties and let's start first with machine engineering so 
Medieval era crafting activities associated with mechanical clocks and iron implements were in place when experiment, experimentation and testing with steam occurred. So the engineers henceforth, they provided expanded services uh, during the rena uh, Renaissance period in the design and manufacture of cylinders, valves, joints, and flow control instrumentation. So together with the specialized machinery for making tools for purpose of manufacture, assembly, and maintenance of mechanical device. And then um, the next one, we'll talk about mining engineering. So at the time of the first new Komen steam engine, water seepage limited coal mining to a depth of about 20 meters. An effective means of pumping water and the adaptability of the steam engine now permitted deeper and larger mine operations. Hence, attention to rock mecha mechanics, uh, tunnel support, ventilation provisions, and coal transport now became important additional engineering considerations uh, during this time. So, this uh, the third one is textile engineering, uh, developed in 1730. Well, uh, the making of fabric for clothing and sales was actually a labor-intensive activity which originated already in prehistoric, uh, that's spinning and weaving. But early Renaissance times, it had become a significant small batch cottage industry involving, however, a uh, considerable variation of fabric quality. But, uh, uh, greatly, invention of power weaving and spinning uh, that's actually the flying shuttle that was developed in 1733. That's what we can see here. And also, the spinning jenny in 1760, the, uh, this one. This, uh, these two led to steam-powered factory-based automation, thereby revolutionizing the entire textile industry. And with textile mills come the textile engineer. So, right now we'll talk about structural engineering. So structural materials had not significantly changed since ancient times. Actually, they also use a wood, stone, brick, and mortar. But the increasing availability of iron, it was, I mean, it suggested new construction possibility to some engineers. So um, they already incorporated uh, iron in a wide aspect. So actually, um, one of the significant, you know, things that we can note here is the 60 meters bridge across the river Severn at Colebrookdale, England. It was assembled from cast iron and was completed in 1779. And this remarkable pioneering structure, the forerunner of large iron and steel structure, is in fact still in use nowadays. So next one is railroad engineering. So uh, metal rails on which wagons were pulled by horses had already been introduced in England's gold industry about 1790. So, um, by 1802, the first steam engine locomotive was introduced in an iron works, and by 1825, the first public steam-powered railroad became operational in England. So the great era of railroad building throughout Europe and in North America was then soon underway. So, uh, the last one is marine engineering. So actually, the first modestly successful attempts of steam power for boats, it began in 1780s on the Delaware River in USA. So uh, these various developments and engineering practice occurred even though, with some exceptions and especially that of France, there were no formal and comprehensive engineering schools. They, they actually have learned on the job a variously practiced appre uh, apprenticeship system and determine self-inquiry into natural phenomena and machine construction. They combine all of these to serve well in the spirit of engineering evolution. Uh, that's very cool, right? So, um, right now, we'll be talking about engineering systematics. So, this in emerging engineering systematic was not sudden, but grew progressively and was influenced most notably by the works of the sextet of Brunelleschi, Gutenberg, Prince Henry, Da Vinci, Copernicus, and Galileo. So these um, amazing people, or these six people, have developed systematics and engineering, wherein they were able to um, create theories and systems which 
are definitely or uh, which is definitely in use even up to now. So uh, let's start with Filippo Brunelleschi. He is actually a modern builder of long suspension bridges and high-rise buildings, and he is intellectual descendant of Brunelleschi. So you know, for for I mean, for those who build uh, bridges and high-rise buildings, their uh, idea about this actually have originated. Uh, also, or significantly with Brunelleschi. All right, and the next one is Johannes Gutenberg. Uh, he was a superb innovator in the making of small devices, paying particularly attention to the integration of a multi-component system. So contemporary designers and builders of robots, fuel cells, and process control instrumentation um, technically follow in the step of Gutenberg. All right, third one is Henry the Navigator. So Prince Henry was evidently uh, the visionary of a grand scheme of global proportions, sustaining an unwavering commitment over extended period of time. The, uh, the later Guglielmo uh, Marconis and Henry Fords can evidently identify with Prince Henry. Uh, the fourth is Leonardo da Vinci. Here is a person with, you know, we all know, exceptionally vivid imagination, a remarkable capacity for graphical dis display, and the ability to coherent scan an enormous range of knowledge, even up to this day. So uh, this capacity for breadth of knowledge and depth of understanding resides with some of the most productive inventors and innovators, and they are actually known as the present-day Renaissance men and women. All right, so... The fifth one is Nicholas Copernicus, and um, uh, this humble contributor to the eventual scientific revolution is commonly associated with the notion uh, that rational thought, that is thought based on observation, measurement, analysis of data, tentative formulation of hypothesis, and the testing of these hypotheses was to be the basis for the theory and practice of both science and engineering. Okay. So the last one is Galileo Galilei. Um, he was a seminal practitioner of an integrated approach to the study and development of devices. Uh, both theory and experiment were necessary. And this dual emphasis on the involvement of both mind and hand has become solidly entrenched in every engineering student's laboratory assignment. All right. So um, here we also have um, good to know information. Did you know that the sextet of exceptional inv individuals had independently discovered the cyclical process for solving engineering problems? They actually have uh, provided um, concepts and ways in solving engineering problems that we are even using nowadays. Okay, and also, um, uh, interesting fact, the calculus... Uh, which is known as one of the most powerful mathematical tool for engineers even nowadays, had its beginning in the late 1600s. Well, technically, it's still during the Renaissance period. So this includes the invention of differential and integral calculus. So uh, the underlying propositions were exceedingly novel when first introduced and consisted of the following. So letter A, the physical word, world could be understood by numbers. Let it be relations between measurable uh, properties of natural phenomena and processes could be specified in algebraic form. And letter C is the fundamental theorem of calculus. All right. So um, those are uh, the topics that we need to know. Specifically, are significantly um, have occurred and prevailed during the Renaissance period. And yeah, again, this has been John. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great day. Thank you and God bless.